We're going to be in one of the greatest books of the New Testament, maybe the first book of Paul's writing in the New Testament. It's an expression of the radically new and free truth that man can be right with God based totally on the initiating love of God, the life and death and resurrection of Christ, and man's faith response. This is the doctrine of justification by faith. It centers in to the grace of God, but the, the needed response of repentant, uh, faithful man. Boy, I think this is a, a tremendously exciting book. You know, this is a book that is primarily doctrinal oriented. And the reason that Paul seems so uh, upset and emotional in this book is because the false teachers that, are, that come to Galatia hit right at the heart of the good news in Jesus Christ. This letter stirred the fires of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther said of this letter, the letter of Galatians is my letter. I have by betrothed myself to it. It is my wife. <laughs> John Wesley found real peace, permanent peace in his life through a sermon on the book of Galatians. This book's truth is desperately needed in our day because of the subtle temptation in every age to drift back into self-oriented um, works righteousness. It is not a problem that the false teachers removed Christ from his central place in salvation. That was not the problem. It's that they added to Christ. It's not what they added. It's that they added anything was necessary for man being right with God besides simple faith in the work and person of Jesus Christ. And boy, it's a subtle temptation. I don't care if it's uh, uh, Baptists adding we don't spit, dance, or chew, or Charismatics adding you've got to speak in tongues, or Church of Christ adding you've got to be baptized here. It's that we add anything to the free offer of salvation in Jesus Christ that we need to hear fresh and anew the message of the book of Galatians. Now, a few other opening comments. This is obviously a letter of Paul. This, like Romans and First and Second Corinthians, has never really been doubted. It has many autobiographical uh, aspects, particularly chapter 1, verse 10, through chapter 2, verse 21. Uh, very similar to Second Corinthians 10 through 13. Uh, and the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians has many biographical aspects, as does Philippians 3, 4 through 6. Now, the date is somewhat caught up in the, in the um, area of the recipients. There have been two major theories. One is a traditional theory uh, that goes back to the earliest uh, church, and it says that this was written to the northern ethnic area of Galatia. And if you look at your map, you'll see it's right in the middle of modern Turkey to the north. is where the Celts uh, came in and settled after they were finally conquered by the king of Pergamum, uh, and it was a ethnic region to the north. It would be recorded in Acts 16.6, Acts 18.23, and if that's true, the date would be somewhere around the middle 50s. But since, um, oh, the 1800s, particularly the ministry of uh, Sir, uh, I think his name is Sir William Ramsey, uh, his book, St. Paul the Traveler and Roman Citizen, I think it was published around 1895, uh, he began to popularize an interpretation that came out just a few years earlier in a commentary. And this was that it's the, the Roman province of Galatia, and therefore it's these, these churches that are mentioned in Acts 13 and 14. Cities like Lydia and uh, I, you know, Iconium, um, Pisidia, those cities that are obviously recorded in Paul's first missionary journey. And so therefore the date would be somewhere around the late 40s. Uh, very close to the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15 because the contents of those two are so uh, much alike. The problem of the Judaizers. Paul and Barnabas visits, visits Jerusalem and tells the leaders about it. Uh, many, many correlations. Now, there have been uh, several listings in Acts of Paul's visits. Matter of fact, there are five accounts in Acts where Paul visits Jerusalem. Nine 26, 1130, chapter 15, chapter 1822, chapter 2115. 
In Galatians, there are two visits, one in chapter 1, verse 18, and one in chapter 2, verse 1, <clears throat> but separated by 14 years. Been much discussion about how, these, how Acts and Galatians relate. It seems to me that the visit recorded in Galatians 1, 18 needs to be identified with the one in Acts 9, uh, 26. And the, the account of um, 2, 1 has almost got to be Acts chapter 15. Now, there are some divergence here. There is some difference. But I think we can explain the difference in the two purposes of the author and um, the different perspectives of the two authors. There are some real differences, but I think that answers the most of the questions. Now, uh, it seems to me that we have to realize that the book of Galatians is one of those books that has really, really uh, met a need in every generation. The book can almost be outlined uh, like this. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 is kind of an introduction to the whole book, a prologue. Chapter 110 through 221 is a personal defense of Paul, very autobiographical about how he is independent from the apostles in Jerusalem, and his message came directly from God through Christ, not through simply the apostles or the authority of the Jerusalem church. Then, uh, the essence of Paul's good news, chapters 3 and 4. Then some of the practical implications of Paul's gospel is in chapters 5 uh, through chapter 6, verse 10. And then chapter 6, 11 through 18 is an epilogue or conclusion. It's obvious that Galatians is related to First and Second Thessalonians and particularly Romans. Many scholars see the order as being First and Second Thessalonians, Galatians, and Romans. But that, that uh, depends on when you see the date of the book. I really think Galatians or First Thessalonians is Paul's first book, and we just can't be certain about that. With that brief introduction in mind, uh, let's go to the text itself then if we could. Paul, verse 1. Now, the word Paul means little. If you take the word uh, Saul into Greek, it means an effeminate waddler. Yuck, who wants to be called an effeminate waddler? Many of us think that maybe everybody had a, gr uh, a, gr a Hebrew name and a Greek name, and Paul was always Saul and Paul, but we're not sure. He began to take the name when he realized he was going to work with Gentile churches. Now, the word Paul means little. A, a, a second century tradition says that Paul was short and bow-legged and bald with bushy eyebrows and protruding eyes. Oh, my. Some say he, he took the name Paul because he was short, but really... I think if you look at verse 13 where he persecuted the church and how badly he felt about that, particularly how he records it in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, the word little may mean in the sense of least of the apostles. But you must understand, though he considered himself the least of the apostles in the sense that he persecuted the church, friends, when it comes to the churches of Galatia, he's going to say, I'm an apostle on rank with the other 12. I even confronted Peter to his face. Uh, and so he's really going to stand up here for his apostleship. Now, the look, next little phrase does say, an apostle sent, and then there's another phrase. Now, the word apostle is the Greek word apostello, which means sent one. Following a Hebrew word and the synagogue use of that term as someone sent with official authority, this word came to be used much like our term ambassador. If you want to see a good reference to the idea of apostle and sent, you might want to see Luke 6, 13, where Jesus uses that term for the twelve. Now, in all of Paul's letters, he mentions he's an apostle, except Philippians, First and Second Thessalonians, and the little book of Philemon. Every other one, he mentioned it. But he really makes a strong statement of it here, because apparently his authority had been challenged. I think the reason he's going to go into a defense of himself is because the false teachers, who we think are the Judaizers I'll discuss in just a minute, have made him an issue and his gospel an issue. Now... Notice this strong phrase where it says, not from men or by any man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Wow, what a strong statement. He's going to repeat that again uh, later on in the letter. Now, what does it mean, not from men, the plural, or by any man? Well, I think it goes back to the fact they were saying Paul gets his authority from the Jerusalem apostles and church. Or they were saying... Paul's not really an apostle at all. Because when you look at the credentials recorded in Acts 2:26, 26, uh, Paul didn't meet all those credentials. He didn't, he didn't walk with the Lord during the Lord's lifetime. Now, Paul claims he did see the Lord on the road to Damascus. 
So there is an element of truth in the accusations the false teachers are making. Uh, they're going to uh, accuse him of being fickle, probably that he circumcised Timothy but didn't circumcise Titus. He's going to say, well, he says one thing to, to you Gentile churches, but he says another thing to Jewish churches. And Paul's going to defend himself of that. Now, Paul did become all things to all men that he might win some, but not in the sense of compromising the gospel. And Paul sees these false teachers as hitting an essential element of the good news in Christ. That's why he's so offensive here. Wow, I'll tell you what. Now, um, let's see. Okay. Notice it says, and by Jesus Christ. You might well see chapter 1, verse 17. This obviously refers to the road to Damascus experience. Jesus himself uh, came to Paul. Jesus himself revealed the essence of the gospel to Paul. Now, we're not saying Paul didn't know something of the gospel uh, from other people. Obviously, because he was such a, a, a zealous persecutor, he heard something of the gospel from the Christians that he tried to make recant. It's obvious that he heard the uh, last sermon of Stephen, where he held the cloaks of them that killed Stephen. Uh, it's obvious that he talked to Peter and James about three years after he was converted. It's obvious he learned something from Ananias. Um, he includes some of the early hymns of the church and poems of the church. So he's not saying he never heard anything from anybody else, but the essence of the gospel he got from Jesus himself. Now, there's one preposition here linking Jesus and God the Father, which is a very strong way of affirming the, the full deity of Christ, uh, who raised him from the dead. There's two different ways to look at this. Most passages, it asserts that, that the Father raised Jesus, and I've given you a multitude of those in your notes. But Jesus does say in John 10, 17 and 18, that he raised himself. So the Trinity is active in all aspects uh, of the work. Now, I think it's important we see that. Now, notice where it says, verse 2, and all the brothers who are with me. Now, some say there's two purposes of this. One, all those who are here from where I'm writing, which depends on which theory, the Northern Galatian theory or the Southern Galatian theory, all that are here agree with what I'm going to say, meaning they don't agree with you and the Judaizers, they agree with me. Or it's a way of linking all the other missionary companions in what he says. They're not co-authors, but they do agree in what Paul says. Now, if it's the, the uh, Southern Galatian theory, Acts 13 and 14, it's Barnabas. If it's the uh, Northern Galatian theory, Acts uh, 16, 6, 18, 23, it's Silas and Timothy, okay? Now, notice what it says, to the churches of Galatia. Notice it's the churches of an area. It's to, it, this is a cyclical letter. Now, of course, Galatia, we wonder exactly uh, what group it is, but it's either the ethnic Galatia or the Roman administrative Galatia. Verse 3, spiritual blessing. This is the word uh, charis, word for grace. The usual Greek reading was charin, which means rejoice. And Paul just changed it to make it uniquely Christian. Grace and peace. Some say it's the way of the Greek grading, karin, kind of charis, and the Hebrew greeting, shalom. Maybe that's true, but we can't draw a whole lot from it. It's kind of be a set formula that's in all of Paul's letters. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, God the Father, of course, is Father in the sense not of, of a sexual generation or chronology, but in the intimate uh, family relationships in a Jewish home. It's that way. God chose intimate family terms to show man what he's really like. Now, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord is a New Testament author's way of emphasizing the deity of Christ, going back to the Jews using Adonai because they were afraid to pronounce Yahweh. If you want to see the term Yahweh, it's Exodus 3.16. Uh, Jesus, the angel gave him that name, Matthew 1.21. It means Yahweh saves. When it's used by itself, the, uh, the New Testament authors use it for the humanity of Christ. And the word Christ, of course, is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah, which means the anointed one, the uniquely called, uniquely equipped, sent one from God. Now, notice where it says then, who gave himself. Now, in verses 4, is going to be, 3 and 4, going to be a summary of the gospel. Four, I mean, three aspects found here in this verse. Number one, who gave himself for our sins. That is a very significant concept in the gospel. Jesus and who he is and what he did is the center pillar of the good news. Now, who gave himself for our sin? You might see Romans 4, 25, Romans 5, 6, and 8, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, and 21. He, he, substitutionary atonement. He died for us. He died for our sin. Here's the second one. To save us from the present wicked world. It's the idea of the present evil age. It's the Jewish concept of two ages. 
used so often in the New Testament. And here's the aspect of this current evil age. You might want to see Matthew 12, 32. Uh, he, we save us to pluck us out, heiress the middle. He once and, for all, once and for all himself saved us, not only from sin in the future, but the current problem of sin. So we have a little bit of the kingdom of God now. It's not consummated, but he saved us out of this, pr this present evil world. The word wicked is emphatic position. You might well see the idea that this, this current age is dominated by the evil one, particularly 2 Corinthians 4, 4 and Ephesians 2, uh, verses 2 through 7. Now, in a, here's number th three. In accordance with the will of God, it was the predetermined plan of God that Jesus come to die. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't an afterthought. He came to die. I think often of Mark 10, 45, the central verse of Mark. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. But here's some even stronger ones. Acts 2, 22 and 23. Acts 4, 27 and 28. He was given up by the foreknown and predetermined plan of God. Yes, indeed. Now, you might also see 2 Timothy 1, 9. Uh, and I think John 3, 16 says the same thing. Now, verse 5. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a closing doxology, very common to this opening prayer. Now, most books now have some word of thanksgiving about the church. It occurs in, in every book, almost of Paul, but not in Galatians. Boy, Paul's upset, and he just plunges into the problem with a gusto that is surprised, I'm sure, the readers. Here, look at verse 6. For I am astonished. Wow. What's Paul astonished about? Well, this may have been some of his very first converts who seem to be pulling away from the centrality of the gospel, the centrality and uniqueness and onlyness of Jesus as a means of salvation. Oh, my. I'm astonished that you are beginning so soon. So soon how? So soon after he left? So soon after the false teachers came? And the false teachers seem to be Judaizers, which is a word we've kind of made up. It means those who said... Uh, Jesus is great, but you've, the, all the Bible is inspired, and the Bible commands that you be circumcised and keep the Mosaic law, so you've got to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. They were adding to Jesus the Old Testament regulations, the Old Testament laws. They were saying, uh, Jesus is good, but he's not all you need. And boy, Paul couldn't handle that, because his gospel was the the, the uniqueness and onlyness of Jesus for man to be right with God. Now, uh, you might want to say that Judaizers wanted circumcision. That's chapter 5, verse 2, chapter 6, verses 12 through 15. They held to special days, probably Jewish feast days, chapter 4, verse 10. And there's an inference in the book about the pushing of food laws, particularly when it recurs to Peter and Barnabas in chapter 2, 11 through 18. See some of the Jewish flavor there. Now, uh, notice if you would where it mentions then, to turn away from him who called you by the favor of Christ. Now, this word turn away is present tense. It has a military aspect of a military revolt. They're, they're knowingly in the process of turning away. And that's why Paul wrote to stop that. Now, notice it says from him. The gospel is not about Jesus. The gospel is Jesus. They're not, they're not turning, just, just fighting over little theological nitpicking. They're talking about the central issue of Christ is all you need through faith to be saved. And so it's a very important issue. Now, the hymn here seems to refer to God. I know that's difficult, but I think in the context, it's got to be God because he who called you is often used of God the Father. Romans 8.30, Romans 9.24, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. It's God who called them by means of Christ. Now, see where it says, uh, who called you by the favor of Christ? Most ancient manuscripts, or many ancient manuscripts, do not have of Christ. They just have grace. Uh, it's not in P46. That's one of the older ones. Now, many of the good manuscripts added this because it was a way of saying that the hymn referred to God and not to Christ. It's God the Father who called you through the grace that is shown us in Christ. That's the idea here, I think. You can see the notes for all the, the manuscript attestation uh, for each of these different views. Now, okay, who, who, uh, from him who called you. Now, the word called, I hear, it really is the idea of election, probably. Called you out of darkness into light. Called you to come to him. Some say it's the idea of God's initiating love. You know, no man comes to the Father. No, God always comes to us first. Now we'll see John 6, 44 and 65. Then notice where it says, to a different gospel. Now the word here, uh, different, is the word heteros. 
And some argue if it's different from the word another one down in verse 7, which is alas. Heteros and alas really in Koine Greek can be synonymous, but sometimes they have the meaning of heteros meaning a different kind and alas meaning another in a series. And so what I think Paul's saying here is not that there are two gospels and the Galatians and the false teachers were kind of leaning toward one and Paul had another. He's saying there's really only one gospel. And what they're telling you is not the true way of being right with God. It's not really good news. It's really slavery. Now, notice what he says. To a different heteros, and now we'll see 2 Corinthians 11, 4, for another use of this same idea of heteros and alas, of the good news, which is not really another one. There is only uh, certain people who are trying to unsettle you. Now, this idea of, per they're, they're not doing it out of ignorance. They're doing it purposefully. We learned later on the letter that some came from James, saying they were from James. The idea is the Jerusalem church, being very Jewish, was nervous about Gentiles being included in what they could still consider to be Judaism, Christianity for a long time, just a little different flavor of Judaism. But this worldwide mission forced it into uniqueness. So some of these converted Pharisees were really concerned about that these Gentiles keep the Mosaic law first. You need to read Acts 15 in connection with Galatians. Now, uh, they're trying to unsettle. You might well see chapter 1, verse 7, chapter 5, verse 10. Uh, they're called agitators in chapter 5, verse 12. Uh, and want to, to turn the good news of Christ uh, upside down. Now, upside down is another military term. Uh, it's the idea of totally to reverse something. What Paul says You've been free in Christ, and now you're trying to uh, uh, try and turn it back over. The, 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 the concept, I think, is that we're right with God totally apart from works. But once we know God in Christ, then our life takes on uh, uh, the quality of good works. But they've just turned it upside down, saying you've got to have the good works of the Old Testament before you can really be saved. Boy, Paul's just really upset about that. The New English Bible and the New American Standard Bible have distort. RSV has pervert. Now... Rules are fine, but only in their proper place. It's knowing Christ that makes us right with God, not keeping certain rules. But even if third-class conditional, potential action, I are an angel from heaven. Paul realizes his gospel from heaven, and it's directly from God, and no one uh, can change it without uh, being accursed by God. You might well see 2 Corinthians 11, 4. Um, preach a good news that is contrary to the one which I have already preached to you, a curse upon him. Now, this curse is the Greek word anathema. It's related to the Hebrew word harem. It means to give something of God, and it becomes holy and can't be used. Very similar to the root hagias, or holy. But here is the added connotation of given to God for destruction, kind of like Jericho was under the ban, given to God for destruction. Paul, I could almost paraphrase this. He's so upset about them messing with the, the essentials of the gospel. It Really what it means is, may they just be damned for what they're doing. Oh, my, what a strong castigation from a man like Paul. Oh, he's uptight, friends. He's going to curse them twice right here. Now, you might well see Matthew 18, 7 for another use of the word anathema or 1 Corinthians 12, 3 and 1 Corinthians 16, 22. I have said it before, which means he must have warned them somewhat told them this might happen, and yet they didn't listen. So now I say it again. If anybody, first class conditional, since there are people saying this to you, preaching to you a good news that is contrary to one, which you have already received. Now the word you have already received, this is the word that is used technically for an oral tradition that someone receives. Uh, this same word is going to be used down in verse 12 again uh, for, uh, in, a, in a same different way. Paul has said he didn't receive the gospel from men, but he did receive it from the Lord. It's, a, it's an aspect of evangelical Christianity that every one of us must receive not only Christ, but the, but the doctrine around him. That's why the word faith can be used for trust, personal trust, or the body of Christian truth. It's used in both ways. Uh, it's used for Christian truth in the book of Jude chapter 3. The faith once and for all delivered to the saints. This is the same idea. You received it, but now they're, they're, they're tending to fall away. If you want to see a good passage about the tradition that Paul received, you might want to see 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 3. He's going to, he's going to admit that he met Peter. I'm sure he wanted to meet Peter to, to hear about the words of the Lord, about many of the actions of the Lord. Paul did receive Christian tradition, but the essence of the gospel he's going to claim he got from the Lord. Now, a curse upon him, 
Oh my, here he comes again with this curse. Now it seems if you look at verses 8 and 9, they kind of form a literary unit. Uh, there are, the same thing about the curse is repeated for emphasis. The first one in verse 8 is third class. That means potential action. But the, the condition in verse 9 is first class, which means it was happening. So Paul says these false teachers are cut off from God because they've really touched the heart of the gospel. This seems so hard to us. In our day, how do we handle this? Do we disagree with every denomination because they disagree with us? Oh, friends, we've got so arrogant denominationalism that we have not even realized there is a, the essential core of truth, and there is peripheral matters that we're not certain on. Certainly we disagree some on the peripheral matters based probably on our parents, who they were, where we were born, when we were born, what the denomination we grew up in, what spiritual gift we have, what personal experience we've had. But the essence of the gospel is how is a man right with God? It's through Jesus Christ alone. Paul screams that. May they be accursed. Anybody who adds anything to Jesus, may they be cut off from God and eternally damned. Oh, friends, we need to have that kind of a, 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 a fervor that the purity of the gospel, not that all that we believe is right, not that our denomination is closest to God, but that the essence of how man's right with God is kept to Jesus and Jesus alone through the initiating grace of God through that life and death and resurrection of Christ that man receives in repentance and faith. That's the heart of it. Let's unite around that. In Jesus' name, God bless you.